Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, main stage here at the National Book Festival, where everyone's going to go ahead and see the great Raider Telgemeier. Got one or two, uh, one or two housekeeping duties. Um, welcome to the 19th Annual National Book Festival, brought to you by the Library of Congress. This festival is free of charge, thanks to the generosity of donors, large and small. If you wish to make a donation, please do so on the festival app under the word donate on the app's homepage. We appreciate your support for this great celebration of books and reading. Um, one of the things that we would like to do is also get people to actually come to the Library of Congress, see the books, and also see the great temple that was built to the library. The Jefferson Building is one of the great pieces of Beaux-Arts architecture, and it is indeed a temple to books, and everyone should visit it. Um, the National Book Festival is going to start being a year-round festival, so stay tuned to the, uh, to the uh, webpage, sign up for emails, and uh, there are going to be more and more events over the course of the year um, that will go ahead and fill in the entire 12-month calendar. We welcome questions at the end for Raina, uh, but as you keep your questions brief and to the point, you are giving us permission to use it for the webcast, so anybody who comes up and asks a question uh, you're going to be recorded. So my name's Warren Bernard. I am the executive director of the Small Press Expo, and we're one of the sponsors of the uh, National Book Festival. And it's especially exciting for me to be up here because Raina got part of her start was coming to shows like Small Press Expo and selling her mini comics. She would make her own mini comics and sell them for the outrageous price of 50 cents each. And back then, you know, you could go walk up, and talk to Rain, stuff like that. And then she got into the Babysitter's Club, and the lines got a little bit longer. And then when Smile came out, the lines got really, really long to see Rain at any of the festivals. And it's totally mind-boggling for me to see this amazing crowd welcome Raina here to the National Book Festival. Anyway, here's Raina. You will go, you're definitely going to enjoy it. Hi. Wow, this is a lot of people. Um, before I do my talk, is it okay if we take a selfie together? Okay, cool. The best way to take a selfie together is for all of you guys that are holding books in your hands to hold them up. And if you don't have a book, then just like make yourself look as excited and cool as possible. And this is, this is gonna take like three photographs because there's so many of you here. So are you ready? Okay, on the count of three. <laughs> One, two, three. I am just like so washed out. Yeah. Okay, one more. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, National Book Festival. Thank you, Warren. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. This is so lovely. Um, we're going to start my slideshow. So as soon as I can tell where it's being projected, I will start talking. There it is. Awesome. OK, and I have a clicker. You can tell I've done this a few times, right? Because I'm like, what's happening? OK, so my name is Raina. And um, I'm going to give you the pronunciation guide for my last name. It's Telgemeier, which rhymes with the name Helga and Tyre. So Helga, Tyre, Telgemeier. Um, yeah, it's tricky. It's German. So <laughs> um, those are some of my books. <laughs> I am a graphic novelist. Which is awesome. It's, it's the coolest job in the world. And today I have three pieces of advice for all of you. And those pieces of advice are read books, talk to people, and share your story. So let's start with the first one. Read books. Pretty simple, right? Books are something that I've liked to read since I was pretty young. This is a picture of me in fourth grade. And I'm smiling in this picture, but I was kind of a shy kid. Um, I didn't tend to raise my hand in class or, or put myself out there when, when something cool was going on. I was kind of just like, hmm, in the corner. But I really did like to read books. 
And I got a lot of my books from the Scholastic Book Clubs and the Scholastic Book Fair. You can see in this slide, there's like a Babysitter's Club book, and I got my Babysitter's Club books through the book fairs and book clubs. And then in the middle, there's a Calvin and Hobbes collection, and that was another thing that I loved to get from Scholastic, was the, the comic book collections of newspaper strips that I used to read. So one of my favorite comic strips is Calvin and Hobbes by Bill Watterson. And if you haven't read Calvin and Hobbes, it's about a boy named Calvin and his tiger, Hobbes. And um, these two have big imaginations and big adventures. And most of the adventures are in Calvin's imagination. So they go back in time. They hang out with dinosaurs. They go into space or the future. And so it's a lot of fun to read. It's really well drawn, so it's fun to look at. And the thing about Calvin, and the thing about a lot of kids, is that with a big, big imagination comes sometimes the idea to imagine that something's wrong with yourself. So Calvin would sometimes experience anxiety. And in this comic strip, he is imagining that one night when he's very sick, that something might be really wrong with him, and that maybe he's going to die of his like illness that he's suffering from. And then in the morning, he feels better. But that's not unlike what I experienced as a kid, is that every time I didn't feel well, I would sometimes panic. And um, I would say that it made me feel less alone to see it in a comic strip and to read about a kid like Calvin who felt the same way. Um, yeah, this was the reality of my life. That happy, ch that you know, smiling class portrait was part of it, but I also was subject to panic attacks and worrying that something was really wrong with me. Um, I was also a big fan of the Babysitter's Club books, and these were just the novels. They were just words on paper back before they existed as graphic novels, and what a cool thing that 20 years later I got to adapt and illustrate these books into comics. Um, but back in those days, I was just interested in the characters and their stories. So this is one of the books in the early part of the series, The Truth About Stacy. And the truth about Stacy is that she's got diabetes. And that's an invisible illness. It's not something people can see when they look at her, but it does affect everything about her life. It affects the way she eats, it affects the way she talks to her friends, and the way she handles her own life. So seeing that in a book also gave me a lot of courage, because even though I didn't have um, diabetes, I did have another invisible illness called irritable bowel syndrome, <laughs> or IBS. And what that means is you have a lot of stomach aches and you don't know why. And there's no medical reason for it. And this is something I started suffering from when I was in elementary school, and I still suffer from it to this day. And I'm proud to tell you that at this present moment, I do not have a stomach ache. So knock on wood, that is not the case. <laughs> But it's something that I deal with. And it's something that's really hard to talk about. It's hard to say to somebody, you know what, I, I got to get off stage right now because I got to go to the bathroom. Or if you're in class and you, you know, you need to leave class or you need to like get out of the car or off the bus, like how are you supposed to handle that? And it's something that we just don't talk about that much. It's like a reason to feel embarrassed. But reading about another character that had something about themselves that they weren't sure how to talk about was super helpful for me. Speaking of comic strips, I have been a huge, huge fan of Lynn Johnston's For Better or For Worse since I was a little kid. And the coolest thing about For Better or For Worse is that all of the characters started out young. I was about the same age as the kids in the strip, and then they aged in real time. So over the years, it's kind of like we grew up together. I felt like I had been friends with the Pattersons and their friends and their family for most of my life. So in this particular strip, Elizabeth, who's the daughter in the Patterson family, is getting teased by a classmate because her classmate got her ears pierced. And Lizzie really wants to get her ears pierced too, but she won't, she, her parents won't let her. So she's, she's feeling teased. She's feeling, you know, belittled. And um, I could totally relate to that because I also had friends who gave me a hard time. And it's unclear why kids give each other a hard time so much, but you know, we're all kind of reflecting what goes on in our minds and in our, in our personal lives, and sometimes we take it out on each other. But I didn't understand it. All I know is that seeing it in media really helped me. And so after all of this, I was about 10 years old, I was a fan of comic strips, and my dad noticed that I was reading a lot of comics. And he handed me this book, which is called Barefoot Gen, subtitle, A Cartoon History of Hiroshima. Cool. So <laughs> parents probably know, and some of the kids might know, that uh, Hiroshima is the very first city to ever have an atomic bomb dropped on it. And this is a true life story of a survivor of the bomb. So 
you get to know the characters. Gen is um, the middle brother in the family, and you get to know him and his younger brother and his family and his, his friends and his neighbors. And it's, it's hard to read, but you still feel a lot of sympathy for these characters in this wartime setting. And so I'm reading a comic book, and I'm thinking, well, it's definitely going to have a happy ending. Um, on the, in the last chapter of this volume, the bomb falls and half of the characters in the story die. And I was shocked because I thought that comics were supposed to make you feel good. And it turns out comics can make you feel a lot of different things. So I was mad at my dad because I felt like he had tricked me by giving me a comic about something so serious. But I was also really just mad at the world for being such a difficult place. But um, it kind of turned me into a little peace activist, I would say. And um, it's part of why I realized the power of comics and that they could tell just about any kind of story. So I also experienced a ton of empathy for these characters, even though I've never lived through an atomic bombing. Thank goodness. I hope none of us ever have to see that world. But it made me think of how awful it would have been to be in Gen's shoes. And so that also is the power of books, the power of reading, the power of putting yourself into somebody else's world and experiencing it through their eyes. So it's super important to read books because it can help you feel less alone. So the next thing is talk to people, which sounds about as simple as reading books, right? Talk to people. Yeah, talk to anybody who's around you. Talk to your friends. Talk to your family. Um, my Siri is asking me what I'm talking about right now, so I'm just going to turn my phone off. <laughs> it asked me something about what song I was listening to, and I was like, what did I just say that triggered it? Um, talk to Siri. That's my advice. <laughs> no, talk to people. Talk to your friends. Talk to your family. Talk to your teachers. Talk to everybody. Maybe it's just about comics. That's what I used to do. I used to talk about my favorite comics and my favorite cartoon shows. And I was not that big of a talker as a kid. I was kind of shy, like I said, and kind of nervous all the time. But when it came to talking about stuff I was passionate about, you couldn't shut me up. So um, that was good. But I had a really hard time talking about what was really going on inside. So my mom started to notice my anxiety and the tendency to kind of shut down when things were bothering me. What is it that you're so afraid of? Well, I had trouble in school. You know, I got bad grades sometimes. And a lot of times when I would feel anxious about something, my stomach would hurt. But that's not what it was. What are you so afraid of? You know, I also got bullied in school. I had a lot of classmates who I didn't get along with for whatever reason. And it made my days pretty stressful. But that wasn't the thing. What is it you're so afraid of? So now I'm going to talk about the thing that scares me most in life in front of 4,000 people, because that's a cool thing to do. Um, I'm afraid of throwing up. <laughs> that is my biggest fear. It's not snakes, even though I've talked about being afraid of snakes in uh, my previous work. It's not even going to the orthodontist, which is another thing I've talked about in my previous work. It's being sick. For some reason, the idea of being sick scares me more than the thing itself. So the idea of throwing up is probably the worst thing that you could possibly do to me. So like, you know how sometimes you're in class and somebody goes eh, and like makes a noise? Like that would freak me out. And if somebody in my family was sick, I would freak out and leave the house. So um, that's it. <laughs> that's my biggest fear. And somehow just talking about it makes the fear seem a little bit smaller and a little bit less scary to me. And that's exactly what Guts is about. And it's another cool double entendre because guts is literally what's going on inside your belly, but it's also about finding the strength to face those fears and to face those anxieties and insecurities. So I do talk a lot about that stuff in my book. Um, it's not too graphic, I don't think. But it does kind of put you into the experience of another person's panic attack. And it's not easy to depict what it feels like through words alone. But I had the value of you know, art and color and words and sound effects to try and convey how it feels to be so scared. And one of the things you feel is extremely isolated. You feel so alone. You feel like nobody else could possibly understand this feeling. So um, yeah, I, I, was, I was trying really hard just to convey that through my work. Um, and part of what happened when I was younger is that I started to get really scared of eating food. So I was afraid that if I ate the wrong food, it would make me very ill. So I used to love going to salad bars and buffets, but suddenly I was like, ooh, this thing might have bacteria in it. Ooh, I don't know if I want to touch that spoon because what if the wrong person touched that spoon before me? And it's just like it magnifies, it gets bigger, it spirals into something huge. And then I just wouldn't eat. 
And so my parents were worried about me. And um, that was about the time when my parents took me to therapy. So I was in fifth grade when I started going to see a therapist. And her name was Lauren. And she is a character in Guts. And um, this is one of the relationships that I had to you know, come to terms with. I was not into the idea of going to see a therapist because it seemed scary. It seemed like something I should be ashamed of. But was it? I don't think it was. This was also like the late 80s, and so I think the stigmas have changed just a little bit between then and now. And now something, I, I think more people do talk about anxiety and sometimes being in treatment for anxiety as well. So I'm, I'm glad to see that things have changed a little bit. But Lauren really helped me a lot. We talked about all sorts of stuff, um, just, you know, about like the fact that I had a big family and had to share bedrooms with multiple people and we only had one bathroom and that was not good. <laughs> um, and we talked about the fear itself and how I just had this sense that I was like falling through space and could not feel my feet underneath my body. And so one of the things we did was we learned about kind of grounding yourself and, and thinking about your feet on the floor and then different breathing exercises. And uh, it was really, really helpful. So if my clicker would work, there we go. So eventually I did admit to my friends what was going on and it was usually in smaller groups, not like getting up in front of the whole class or 4,000 people in the you know, big main room of the National Book Festival and saying, I have anxiety, I'm afraid of throwing up, I see a therapist, I can do it now. You know, th 30 years does a lot for one's confidence, but um, yeah, once I actually started talking to my friends about it, it turned out that we were not all so different. Some of them were seeing therapists too. Some of them had things that they were anxious about too. So just being able to talk broke down those walls and it was so helpful and powerful. So please talk to people, be brave. It will probably help you. Finally, my third piece of advice is to share your story. And this is what I've sort of made a career of is sharing my different stories with people and by virtue of talking about these things, I've managed to feel less alone. So when I was a kid, <laughs> I liked to draw. These are some of my masterpieces from when I was small. And the one on the left is from just before my second birthday. I was a kid who liked to scribble. My parents gave me paper and crayons and markers and I just made marks on paper because I enjoyed it. And I think a lot of kids enjoy it. And I am a kid who never stopped. I still like making marks on paper. Um, the one on the right is from closer to my fourth birthday, and you can tell that I was really looking and paying attention and trying to capture figures and humanoid characters with pizzas for faces, I guess. I don't know what that's about, but um, it's, it's cool that my mom kept all of these drawings because it's very fun to look back over the whole course of my life and see my progression. Um, these are some of the first comics that I ever made. So I started reading comics when I was about nine, and by the time I was 10, I couldn't stop drawing my own. And I would just look at what I had read, I would try and capture that same sense of energy, the types of, um, it's like a setup and then a punchline, you're creating characters, you're creating dialogue, and there was a lot to learn. For example, I don't know where the word balloons are and where the boxes are and stuff. I would just start drawing and then I'd try to like fit the box around the, <laughs> the drawings. It's easier to start with the box and then draw the pictures in the box. It's easier to write the words and then draw the word balloon around the words so that you make sure everything fits. And sometimes that helps you go, wait, this is way too many words. I need to cut a few words. So it's a process, but I think it's a process that you learn best by simply doing. So over the years, my comics have improved. And um, this is a comic that I drew when I was in college. It was a very short story called Beginnings. And it's actually one of the mini comics that Warren was talking about earlier. I, I wrote this story for a class. It was three pages long. It was called Beginnings. And it was actually about my experience of reading Barefoot Gen when I was nine years old and how deeply that comic impacted me. And I feel like it has continued to impact me throughout my life. But I'm having a conversation here with my mom where my mom, I say to my mom, I think that book ruined my life. And she says, I, I think it actually made your life better. You just haven't realized it yet. And I think she was totally right. Um, a book that you read at any point in your life can change the course of your entire life for the better. Um, this short comic has sort of taken me in a lot of places. It's part of why I met my editors at Scholastic. They read that mini comic. 
And they were like, we really like this short story. We'd, be, we'd like to work with you. And that was what led to me getting the Babysitter's Club, which is a strange jump. Like, I made a comic about World War II. And they're like, okay, let's, you know, <laughs> do Anna Martin's The Babysitter's Club. But, you know, there was, there was a spirit there. And they, they saw it and they liked it. But um, it was republished in Japanese by somebody who translated it just for fun because the book Barefoot Gen had been banned by a library in Japan. And um, this pedestrian just wanted to use my short comic as an example of why that book was important and why he thought that his kids and all kids should have a chance to read it. And I, I, I agree with him. And then it got republished in a couple of newspapers and I can't read Japanese, but like seeing that is really cool. So um, you really never know. You really never know when sharing your story is going to connect you with others. Oh, and here's a picture of me when I was 11 years old and I had this experience that I don't think any of you have heard about. Um, I had an accident where I knocked out my two front permanent teeth and then had to spend the next four and a half years of my life getting my face reconstructed. I should tell you this story sometime. Actually, wait, I already did that. Um, I took that experience and weaved it into a graphic novel called Smile. And that was my first original graphic novel. It was published in 2010. And much like my short comics, I feel like this book has changed my entire life for the better. It's taken me all over the world. And before it was published, I had a couple of people say to me, no one's going to be interested in reading a comic about braces. And you know, no one's going to understand this comic that takes place in 1989. That's so weird. But what happens when people read the story is they see themselves. They can see their own pain. They can see their own insecurities and anxieties. A lot of them have braces, it turns out. I've heard kids have braces. Like, it's crazy. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's awesome. And I, I, it's been translated into like 25 languages at this point. So <laughs> share your story. You never know. Um, and then I kept doing it. So my second memoir is called Sisters, and it is the elevator pitches. It's about being on a road trip with your siblings. That's the whole story. But, you know, a lot of us have been there before. A lot of us have siblings, or we have families. and <laughs> We've been on road trips, and we've, we've got relationships with people that are so interesting that you can't help but want to tell their story. So um, that's what I've continued to do. And it's been really lovely to, like, talk to people, and they're like, oh, my gosh, I have a sister, too. And that's, that's it. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> we're the same. Um, it's really, and sometimes people are like, I've never had a sister, but now I know. So <laughs> that's cool, too. So um, I wrote a fiction book called Ghosts, and it was published three years ago. So I write both memoir and fiction. But a lot of times, my fictional work has elements of my own life in it and, and aspects of my personality. So I am still reaching pretty deep inside in order to create my characters. And when I went on tour for this book, I talked a lot about how Kat, who's the older sister in this family, was anxious. And she was always worried about her little sister. And she was worried about life and about death. And so I would stand on stages like this one, and I would say, Kat and I have anxiety in common. And then I'd move on to the next subject, and people were like, wait, 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 slow down. What? <laughs> this is interesting. Tell us what you mean. And so sometimes those are the signals that lead me to a, a project where I go, you know, that is something that's maybe worth investigating, and maybe that is a story that I want to tell. So thank you, readers, for being curious about me and my life and about what I have in common with my characters. Um, so yeah, Guts is really about managing that and about examining it and trying to put it onto the page. And because I've been a cartoonist pretty much my whole life, over 30 years, I have had the benefit of being able to share my stories in a way that other people can read them and appreciate them and connect with them. Um, and I feel extremely lucky to be able to do that. And that's not to say that if you're not a cartoonist, you don't have other ways of sharing your stories. You can write poetry, you can sing songs, you can make YouTube videos, you can do so many different things to express your point of view and your stories. But I encourage you to do that, because sharing your story means that other people feel less alone, and then the circle is complete. Oh, and I have another project that I'd like to tell you about, it turns out. <laughs> it's called Share Your Smile. And that's an extension of the last slide. And it's hard when you don't have the slides in front of you, so you're not like, oh, and next thing I want to say is this. Um, Hello. So, <laughs> so Share Your Smile is actually sort of like a how-to and sort of a 
an idea prompt builder, it asks a lot of questions. And I think that's one of the most helpful things that you can do if you're writing stories is to ask yourself questions. You know, who are these characters? What are their families like? Where are they from? Where do they live? What do they like about the place that they live? What do they hate about the place they live? What do they like about their school? What do they like about their, you know, car? There's, there's so many questions that you can ask yourself. So this book asks a lot of questions and then it's your job to fill in some of the answers and then use those answers as jumping off points to tell your own story. And it's been so much fun to see kids filling the book in or writing their own comics and then showing them to me. I love seeing other people be creative. And now we get to talk about graphic novels, which is my favorite subject of all. <laughs> so graphic novels are real reading. I feel like this is, thank you. This is a funny conversation that we've been having over the last few years where somebody, somebody sometimes will say, graphic novels are not real books. Just because you read them in an hour, just because they have pictures, just because they make you laugh, just because they make you, you know, want to read the next book immediately in the series, that doesn't mean it's not a real book. That's totally what a real book is. And it's, you know, they've got characters, they've got plots, they get people so excited and it is, it is so legitimate and it's really lovely to be here, especially at a celebration of books and reading and to be able to talk about graphic novels in the same space and on the same stage as some luminaries in the business. Um, and graphic novels are a medium, not a genre. This is a mistake that people sometimes make. They'll say, I love the genre of graphic novels. And I'm like, wait, that's like saying I like the genre of movies. Movies are a format. Movies are a medium for storytelling, and graphic novels are the same. So graphic novels come in many flavors. You can have westerns, slice of life, mystery, history, <laughs> science fiction. And sometimes people like to blend all of those things together. But a graphic novel is basically anything you want it to be, as long as there are both words and pictures. Graphic novels still face a lot of stigma. Um, this is from a comic strip called Heart of the City by Mark Tatuli, who has a book out right now called Short and Skinny. And um, it was a, a week of strips where the mom kept pushing back and saying, a graphic novel is not a real book. I want you to check out a real book from the library. And what her daughter had to do was to make her read the graphic novel. And Mark, thanks Mark, he used Smile as the graphic novel that they were talking about. And at the end of the week of strips, um, mom had been convinced. And she was like, oh, this is actually a really good book. And her kid goes, graphic novel. <laughs> so it's just, it's just important to like spread this knowledge amongst the gatekeepers in your lives, be they librarians, teachers, parents, educators. Um, we all need to sort of be together on this one that graphic novels are amazing. I think this slide got cut off, but it says you probably know the graphic novels are awesome. <laughs> and I think everybody in this room can probably agree on that one, which makes me super happy. So one thing that's important to say is that graphic novels take a long time to make. And I think part of the problem is they can be read in like an hour and people are like, okay, when's the next one coming out? And I'm like, it took me three years to make that. And um, so please read it a second time <laughs> and maybe a third time. Um, some of you probably noticed today that I was not signing books today and that's because my wrist is in the process of blowing out. And when I sign books, it actually takes a little bit away from the future of me being able to make more books. So I have to be extremely selective of when, where, and how many books I sign. And I'm about to embark on a two and a half month book tour for Guts. So um, <laughs> I just kind of have to pace myself. So I apologize for that, but I'm glad I got to take pictures with those of you that came. So um, that's me doing a stock signing of 4,500 books in Texas. And I had to tape up my arm like an Olympian. But comics can be as long or as short as you want them to be. So if you're somebody who wants to make comics and you're intimidated by the fact that graphic novels take a long time to make, make a one page comic make a two-page comic, make a 10-page comic. It'll give you a chance to build your chops and to give yourself the experience of practicing. And then at some point, if you want to write a long-form graphic novel, you can. Um, this is a single-page story that I did around the same time as I did the story beginnings for my mini comics. This one's about my first cup of tea. That's it. <laughs> that's, the whole, that's the whole comic. Nothing wrong with that. Um, graphic novels inspire budding creators. So one thing I have seen a lot of, and this was true for me as a kid too, 
when I read my first comics, I immediately wanted to make my own comics. So um, if you've got a, a, an inspired reader in your life, the next thing you know, they might be a writer, an illustrator. But all of us start out reading, and then some of us continue to want to be a part of words and pictures, and it's wonderful. Graphic novelist is an actual career, believe it or not. This is for you guys, mom and dad. Um, it can happen. It takes a lot of work, and you spend a lot of time. I have actual assistants now who help me out in the studio. I still do all of my own artwork, but I have somebody who scans my pages, somebody who answers my email. They're super cool people, and most of them are also um, younger creators, and so it's nice to kind of mentor people and show them, you know, and pay them for the work they do, honestly, because they deserve that. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the actual career. This is my, my process talk, just because one of the things people is, ask me is like, well, how do you make a graphic novel? And it's so much easier to show than to tell. Again, that's a cartoonist thing. We're like, let me just show you, because the pictures are part of the story. So when I write, it is in a format called thumbnails. And that means that my ideas exist in my head, and when I put them on paper, they look just like this. They are already comics. They already have words and pictures and um, panels and word balloons, and I'm not spending that much time. I'm just kind of doodling little stick figure characters and then putting words in their mouths, and then I do this for the entire book. So I will do 250 pages of thumbnails, and then I basically have a blueprint for the whole thing. And I send those to my editor, and she is comic savvy, so she's able to look at this and see what I'm trying to go for. And then we edit my project from this stage. So I am often redrawing my thumbnails, but you know, each page only takes maybe five minutes. And what we're looking for at this stage is like, is the character relationship, are they all working? And, and how's the narrative arc feeling? And is there a part that could be expanded or shortened or clarified? So I'm doing all of the things that an editor-creator relationship would do at this stage, which is just making the book as good as it can be. But when that stage is finally done, like I said, the thumbnails do act as a blueprint. And so then I'm able to move on to final artwork. And I'm using a lot of the same tools, but I switch my paper up to something called Bristol board, which is just thicker, smoother, heavier, takes um, pencils and erasers a little bit better. So I'm actually going to go back one slide just to show you the difference between the thumbnails and the pencils. So. It's the same information. It's pretty much the same thing. It's just that I'm spending more time when I'm doing the pencils as when I did my thumbnails. So, you know, it was comics all along. And so after the pencils are done, um, I move on to inking. And I'm using all analog tools here. I use a watercolor brush dipped into a bottle of waterproof India ink going right over the same page. So I'm just tracing my pencil lines. And this is where I can add like darks and lights and do some cross hatching and make it look as pretty as I want it to. And then I scan my work into a computer. And then it goes from being a piece of physical art to being digital art. And I open up my files in Photoshop. And then I'm able to make tiny corrections to my work. So instead of using like whiteout to um, cover up lines I'm not happy with, I'll just use Photoshop and you know use like my my stylus or my mouse to do that. Um, oh, I just realized, is more in here? Okay, I just realized that um, my, you, hi. Can you get me my bag, which is backstage? It has my eye pencil in it. I'm gonna need that in a minute. Um, thank you. So um, in Photoshop, I am able to do my digital cleanup, like I said. This is what prompted me to realize I have digital stuff up on stage that I'm gonna show you guys in a bit. So um, this is where the coloring is done, and I actually don't do my own colors. I work with a colorist named Brayden Lamb. He is awesome. Thank you so much, Megan. <laughs> Yay for assistance. Um, and Brayden has been coloring my work since Sisters, I think. He colored Sisters, Ghosts, all four of my Babysitter's Club books, and Guts. And he's super talented and awesome. And he's also coloring Gail Galligan's Babysitter's Club books right now, too. So I feel like the color really adds a lot to it. And a lot of times I'll tell him what I'm looking for, but then um, he goes crazy. Like with ghosts, I told him I kind of want it to look like foggy and beachy and windy, and he just knocked it out of the park. Like those cool greens and blues and everything that he used, I loved it. So um, this is also a digital part of the process. So that happens in Photoshop, and now we have a pro uh, program called Clip Studio that a lot of people color in. 
And then um, the rest of the process is just something that the book designer at Scholastic works on. They do the design and the layout. They put all the pieces together on the page, assemble the files, and then those files get sent off to the printer. And then cover sketches. I mean, this is pretty important, because this is the first impression of your work that people are going to have, what's going to be on the cover. And I think Scholastic also has really strong design sense, and they know what's going to sell and what's going to pop off the shelf and stuff like that. And I'm illustrating those pictures. So I do a bunch of sketches, sometimes up to 60 sketches of a cover before we pick one that really works. And then I do the illustration, and then Phil, the designer, puts all of the pieces together the typesetting and the words and all of that stuff. And then again, those files get shipped off to Asia, printed there, put onto a boat, and then they put them on the um, shelf at Politics and Prose, and people get to read them, <laughs> which is really nice. So holding the finished book in your hands for the first time never gets old. I don't have any kids. Um, I can't say that this is exactly like holding your baby in your arms for the first time, but it's a pretty good feeling. <laughs> I can confirm. So um, I keep doing it. Thank you. That is my slideshow. OK, and now is the part where I'm going to open up my um, other program, and I'm going to draw. Oh, wow. So somebody just has to switch the cables up here. Um, and once they do, I will draw for you, but I can start out. There we go. Um, I need a couple of prompts from the audience. So I need an idea for a place and two objects. And ideally, they should not have anything to do with each other. So you with the blonde hair, I saw your hand go up first. So what, do you have an idea for a place? Yeah. Hmm. The woods, I like that. Okay, now I need uh, two objects that have that you would never find in the woods. That's very, very important. How about you with the white t-shirt right there? Yeah. A pig. OK, I like pigs extremely a lot. So um, we're going to go with a pig in the woods. And then how about you with the pink and black pants in the very front? A unicorn. I mean, pigs and unicorns, you see them together all the time, right, in the woods? OK, why not? Um, so I'm using a program called Procreate, and I just have to make sure that my settings are visible on screen. So let's try this. Can you see that? Excellent. OK, so this is going to sort of imitate what it would be like to have a pencil and paper. And that means I'm just going to do some super quick sketching on my screen. And um, you know, when I'm doing my comics, it's not unlike what I'm doing right here. I'm just like sketching in a bunch of cool stuff. Uh, okay, so we got a pig and a unicorn <laughs> in the woods. Um, those are two trees. That represents the woods pretty great, right? Um, so let's see. I just said I love pigs, but of course now I'm like, how on earth do you draw a pig? I bet there's somebody in this audience who would draw like the best pig ever. But I'm going to draw my version of a pig, which is a very cartoony pig. Um, somehow I never learned to draw animals very well. That was always my sister's wheelhouse. She's an animal drawer. And I tried to be, but it just, <laughs> I am always much more comfortable drawing people for some reason. Um, maybe if, if I knew that animals had as awesome of real facial expressions as people, I would draw more animals. But anyway, now a unicorn, that's a little trickier because I don't have ever seen a unicorn before. <laughs> it's just like a horse, right? I know, I don't draw horses that often either. Okay, well, it's going to be a pretty dopey looking unicorn. Oh, right, horn. Yes, that's how you know it's a unicorn. <laughs> All right. So um, those have the same kinds of feet as pigs, right? <laughs> In my world, unicorns totally have the same <laughs> kinds of feet as pigs do. <laughs> oh, no, so bad. OK, so um, not much is happening here. So I'm actually going to like shrink the screen a little bit and then do some erasing, because I want to. I want to add to the scene here. I'm gonna, I usually like figure out a way to work my character into it, which sounds awfully a lot like centering myself into the conversation, but that's what you do when you're an autobio cartoonist. So you get to be the star of the story. So I'm gonna put myself here, like reacting to the scene. And oh, gotta do that eraser again. <laughs> 
You never know what you're going to get when you do this exercise. Like, what do you think she should be saying now that she's discovered a pig and a unicorn in the woods? Not, no one's sure I have an idea. I think um, they should be throwing her a surprise birthday party. Oh, wait. No, no, no. I'm going to go back. I'm going to have the pig say, oops, surprise. Do to do, do comics. Happy birthday. I covered up the horn. That's okay. All right, let's put some more trees in there. As Bob Ross would say, happy little trees. Just to set this stage. Okay, so now I have now I have like a sketch. And so now this program is cool because I can make an extra layer and I'll call this layer inks. How do you spell inks? I-N-K-S. Okay. Cool. And then I'm going to use a different tool for this. I'm going to use a pen tool and I'm going to make the color black so that it shows up differently. So change my color to black. And again, this program is called Procreate. So um, that's a really weird name, but it's, <laughs> it's a really cool program for sketching. So I want my brush to be more opaque. And this is what I would normally do with like a brush or a pen, I would start to go over my other drawing and make it look a little bit more refined. So I hope, yeah, you guys can see this okay. And this is a chance to kind of move things around and if things don't really fit, I can make them bigger or smaller. Um, for, the, for the sake of just like doing a quick sketch on stage, I'm not going as crazy with it, but like this hand is not the way I would normally draw a hand. I just wanted to get the space down for that hand as quickly as I could before. Oops, I made the opacity really, really low. There we go. Computers are cool because you can go back and change things. So I'm gonna fix this hand to look more like a hand and less like a weird mitten. Um, people often ask me like, how did you learn to draw things like hands? And I'm like, I practiced. I took a lot of figure drawing classes when I was in high school. And some people take figure drawing, which is where you're literally just looking at a human being and drawing them. Sometimes they're naked. That part's interesting. But, um, oops, so, here's my cat. So, <laughs> sometimes people like shy away from drawing things like hands and feet. And I always saw it as a challenge. I was like, let me just draw the model's hands or the model's feet, because I think it's, it's one of the more interesting things about drawing people. So um, yeah, with this program, you can like make things bigger. I'm gonna make my lettering look nicer. I might not finish this whole drawing right now because I think you guys kind of get the idea. I will draw that pig though, because I love pigs. Okay, I'll make my word balloon look a little nicer. Do, do, do. Um, and the nice thing about not working with traditional tools is that you don't spill your ink all over the place. That is something I have done more than once in my life. And I do have cats now. The cats are pretty new and the cats like to do things like come up onto my desk while I'm working and like sit on my pages, which is really cute. But I'm like, dude, <laughs> I'm trying to work here. And they, they often um, put their noses into my, um, my inking water, <laughs> which is also really adorable, but not good. Like they don't want to drink their regular water, but if it's inking water that I'm paying attention to, they're all over it. That totally looks like a pig. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm from the cartooning school where like you just kind of approximate like, oh yeah, that's, that's a pig. It's another reason I love comics. I studied a lot of like real drawing and, you know, figure drawing to learn how to do things the right way. But once you learn how to do them the right way, then you can start breaking all of your rules and making it look your own way. So pigs' feet are awesome. Okay, now I'm just gonna kind of sketch those trees back in there. So um, yeah, so what I can do now is I can go back into my layers and I can turn off that bottom layer. So then it just leaves the ink in, in the back. So I'm gonna draw that in there because it looks a little weird without it. I'll turn the, the layer back on. So you can see my sketch underneath, right? And then you can turn the layer off when you're ready for the print version, which is just the inks. So um, that's a little drawing demo for you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. And now, my favorite part, which is Q&A. 
So if you have questions, I am going to ask that you guys use um, the two microphones on either side of the stage here. Um, we have two, so you can use two. And I will go back and forth between them. So um, yes, we're going to start on this side. So you are the first question. Hello. Did you ask permission from your siblings to put <gasps> them in your book? We are getting right to the hard-hitting questions. In fact, I did. Um, my sister was the first person to read the script of Sisters. And I said, do you want me to change anything? Are you comfortable with this? And her response was, our little brother is so much more annoying than you made him. So make him way more annoying. And so that's what I did. <laughs> now I'll go to this side. Hi. Uh, uh, when, you, um, when you made the book Sisters, um, was all that true? You, like the whole um, road trip and the, um, you know, um, those like childhood flashbacks with you and your yeah, sister. They were. Um, mm -hmm. The thing that I do with my memoirs sometimes is I'll take events that happened over the course of like five years and I will squish them down into a shorter period of time. I call it compressing the timeline. And that's just because like, it's kind of boring sometimes. Did you, were you also as crazy for a sister as you were in the book? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, all of the emotions and, and feelings in the books are 100% true. Hi. Hi, I do have a real, relevant question, an adult, <laughs> um, but I want to give a background. I work with kids in DC public schools. Actually, we bring mentors in literacy to kids and Library of Congress, Hill staffers and community members come and read with our kids once a week for an hour out of their, their week. And my question is to you, well, first of all, to thank you for making books relevant for kids that are important topics in their lives that can really re resonate, even with my, my own daughter and with the kids we work with. But our challenge is how to get kids to love reading and how to get them motivated to pick up a book and find it enjoyable and find that love. So my question is to you, how do you, how do you suggest getting kids in, interested in reading? I mean, I, I think a lot of kids are intimidated by words on a page. Maybe there's just too many words. And so for those kids, graphic novels really are kind of a perfect gateway um, just to getting to love stories. But you can also read out loud to kids, you know, like just share, share prose works and poetry. And like I said, um, sometimes reading inspires writing. So, so getting kids just to share their stories with one another and with the class or, you know, as an exercise. I know that sounds like homework, but if you ask the right questions, writing comes naturally to a lot of people. So um, there's so many ways, and I, I, I wish you luck. Thank you. Graphic novels have been an amazing gift Thanks. for kids. Thank you. Hi. How do you get your inspiration for your books? Most of my books are inspired by my life. So I've had all these things that have happened to me over the course of my life. And as a, as a writer, I've been able to look back and say, what was the weirdest thing that I experienced in middle school? Or how did I feel when this thing happened to me? And I can usually tra sort of channel those feelings and those memories into stories. Not every memory is, is good for a story, but um, I like to draw and I like to write. And so eventually I just usually settle on something where I'm like, that's worth spending some time on. And uh, yeah, it just kind of comes naturally. Thank you. Hi. Um, do you have any ideas planned for your next book with original characters? And do you plan to add any more LGBT characters for your future books? The second answer to your question is 100% yes. Um, the first question, I'm working on it. I am uh, in the process of thinking about what my next book is going to be. And it'll be a couple of years before I'm ready to announce it. But um, I'm excited. I, I love making books. Please take your time. Oh, thanks. It, <laughs> I, I can see how much your hand hurts. Oh, thank you. That happens to me all the time. It's hand stretches. I got a little foam roller for my hand. So I'm going to go back to my room and do that. <laughs> thank you. I, I hope to see you again in the future. Likewise. Thank you. Hi. Um, when did Guts come out? And it hasn't come out yet. So when people say, what's your next book? I still have an answer, <laughs> which is, this is like the best part. It comes out on September 17th. 
So um, yes, I will be at the Small Press Expo right before the book comes out. So I won't be back in DC this year after the book is published, but um, it'll be at every bookstore when it is. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Um, did you always have the computer program? And if not, what did you use before it? So I'm super old. And um, my family didn't have a computer until I was nine years old and my sister was five. And there's, there's actually this anecdote in sisters that as soon as my family got a computer, she was like, mine. And she just kind of hogged it most of the time and she figured out how to use the art programs on it right away. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. And I kept drawing on paper. So I didn't even really start using a computer till I was in college, which again, tells you just how old I am. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and before, I mean, I still use the same tools, pen, paper, ink, <laughs> markers. <laughs> Hi. What do you love most about being a cartoonist? Oh my gosh, there's so many things to love about it. And um, for me, it sort of satisfies two parts of my personality. I really like working by myself and coming up with ideas. And for me, sitting at my desk and drawing feels like meditation. It feels like breathing deeply. And at the end of a day, even though it's a very long day, I'm usually like, that was so much fun. I listen to podcasts, you know, I just, I get to kind of be in my own world. But then as soon as I've created a book, I get to go out and kind of share the joy of books with other people. So I really like this part too. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I was wondering, when you were writing Smile, did you think it was just gonna be one story about your life that you were gonna put <laughs> out? Or were you thinking it of it as like the first step in many stories about or inspired by your life? <laughs> I never thought that this was gonna be what it is. Um, and as soon as I finished Smile, I was like, I am never doing that again. But then people kept asking, like, well, what else happened to you in your life? And when are you going to write a sequel? And what, you know, we want to know the continuing adventures of Raina. And I was like, well, nothing else has ever happened to me. But then on like one of the pages of Smile, there is a single panel that talks about a road trip that my family went on when I was 14. And that whole panel is an entire, or that one panel is an entire book. So sometimes I just have to look. And it's like looking at your own photo album and going, oh, right, that thing that happened. Oh, you know, that person was there and this thing happened. So my brain just works that way. Um, I don't know what my future plans are as far as memoirs. I feel like three is a really good number. I probably have like one or two more stories from my childhood that I really want to tell. So maybe I will. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Um, when did Amira start loving snakes so much? <laughs> Um, her name is pronounced Amara, just in case um, that's okay to tell you. But um, she has been obsessed with snakes probably since she was like a toddler. And she always loved animals, but she really loved like the creepy, crawly, gross ones. And I was much more interested in like cats, <laughs> hamsters, dogs. And she was like snakes and spiders and lizards and stuff. And um, yeah, she still really likes snakes. And I do not. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so we have a shared question. Okay. What's your favorite part about writing books? Hmm. I, I really like when I'm done writing a book. And I can, I can be like, yay, here's my new book. <laughs> but then five minutes later, people are like, I finished reading it. Um, like I said, I really like the, the sitting at my desk part. So that means like coming up with the ideas and then writing it and then the drawing. I love the drawing part so much, but that's the part that makes my hand so tired. So the thing I like to do the most is one of the hardest parts. But I don't know, that's, that's a pretty good life. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. So when did you decide to write books about like your life or? Yeah, I didn't, I don't feel like I ever really decided. What, I, what happened was that when I was a kid, my favorite books were realistic fiction. So they were books about kids who were my age and had, you know, experiences with their classmates and their friends. I loved reading realistic fiction. And then when I was like 10, 11 years old, I was drawing comics. I was writing in a diary. And then I started doing those two things together. So I started writing my diary in comics format. And I never showed these to anybody because it was very personal and very embarrassing but I did it from age 11 all the way up until age 25. So that was a lot of years of experience of writing about my life. I never thought that that would become my career, but I had had a lot of practice at it. So it kind of worked out. 
Thank Hi. you. Sure. Um, what's your favorite book that you wrote? <laughs> That's so hard to answer because I like them all. But um, they, I, I love them all for different reasons. I think Smile is my most personal book because I wrote it before I had an editor. And Ghosts is a favorite of mine just because I put so much creativity and um, feeling into it. But I also really like Guts because it's, again, so personal. And I feel like people are really getting to know me, the person, when they read Guts. So I hope you guys will read it when it comes out. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, when you stepped on a snake, why were you so scared? Because it was dead. It was so gross. That's why. I was wearing sandals. I had the same shoes on that you're wearing right now. So it, it was like, a, it's, it wiggled. It was like on a rock. Like I, it just, it like shuddered under my foot. And I was also in the middle of a blackberry patch. So like I stepped on the snake and I was like, ah, and I ran away and then I had to run through the blackberry patch. So I got all scraped up. It was just not a good day. My heart was racing really fast and everybody laughed at me afterwards. <laughs> also, I went blackberry picking like a couple of weeks ago and I was wearing sandals that day too because I never learned and I got a giant scrape on the back of my, my foot. So, yeah, I don't know. But when you, when, when you recently went blackberry picking, if you already stepped on a dead snake in sandals, why did you choose to wear sandals again? You are so much wiser than me. And if you had been there to warn me of this, I would have known better. And I, as it was happening, I was like, seriously, Raina? <laughs> like, this is really, yeah. I don't like snakes but I love blackberries, so <laughs> that's how to answer that one. Hi. How'd you get the inspiration to write, like, figure out the titles? So Smile came to me because it was the actual opposite of how I felt in that story. The last thing I wanted to do was smile when I had braces and when my teeth had been knocked out. But it's also something that happens in our culture that we're often told, like, smile, you don't look happy. Like, you should smile more. And sometimes you just don't feel like smiling. So after that, my editors were like, one word titles, that's your thing. And so now they kind of help me come up with them sometimes. Sometimes um, my editors help out. They really wanted the title of drama to be drama. I wanted it to be called like Callie's Stage Crew Chronicles or something like that. And they were like, no, drama. Like, really? Okay. And then ever since then, I've just accepted it. Um, Guts was also extremely obvious to me when I was working on that story. It just, it's like, it just existed. And that's when you know you're onto something when it just feels so, so right. So I'm, it's really tough though, like coming up with that many one word titles. <laughs> we can do a couple more. We have a few more minutes. So, hi. Um, what was your main inspiration for drama? Um, it was inspired by my high school theater days. So I spent a lot of time backstage playing like <laughs> secondary roles in my school plays. Like it would be, we'd get the program and it would be like, Aristocrat number seven, Raina Telgemeier. <laughs> Hobo number three, Raina Telgemeier. Child, like that was often what I was cast as because I was very short. <laughs> yeah, so um, I spent a lot of time backstage just observing my friends and seeing the dynamics between what was happening on stage, backstage, off stage, and it was fascinating to me. And years later, I was like, I really miss those days and my friends. And so I kind of wrote the book as an ode to all of that. Thank you. Hi. Um are you ever gonna do a book about other people in the stories? Like the secondary story? characters? Yeah. I don't wanna say no. Is there a character you'd like to see a graphic novel about? No, it's like, not really, I just oh, okay. wanna, <laughs> no. No I, I don't have plans for one at the moment, but if uh, I get enough fan letters that want me to write a graphic novel all about Jesse, maybe I will. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Hi. Hello. My sister Justice and I are big fans, but we were um, wondering um, which book of yours took the longest to make? Smile took five years to make okay. from start to finish. Part of that is because it used to be a webcomic, which means that I was publishing one page per week and I was just putting it up on a website. And so people could read the story as I was working on it. And then eventually, four years in, I got a contract from Scholastic and I finished the second half of the book in nine months. But start to finish, five years. Um, the second longest was Guts, which took me almost three. Drama took two and a half. Um, Ghosts took two and a half. Yeah, they take, they take a little over two years a piece. But the Babysitter's Club books I did in a year a piece because I wasn't doing the writing, I was just doing the art. So it's, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. Can we do two more questions? One from this side and one from that side? Um, Hi. 
What advice do you have for like drawing? For drawing, like how to how to get better at drawing? Or? Yeah. I mean, just keep doing it, and also look like look at photographs, look at real people, look at um, landscapes, look at other art, look at things that you like, and then try and try and capture what you see. Um, practice. I don't know if it makes perfect, but it it makes art. <laughs> so you've made a lot of art by the time Thank you keep you. practicing. And then we're gonna do the last one on this side. Hello. Hi. So I enjoy writing and stuff, but once I get deeper into the book, it, or like, I don't really write a whole book, but like, it sort of gets boring after a while. Mm. Like, so how do you sort of fight off that boredom? That's a tough question because I think all we all suffer from some degree of like writer's block or artist's block. <clears throat> I don't usually start a story until I know it's a story that I want to tell. So I will often do like a complete outline of a story and say, this is the beginning, the middle, and the ending. So I know where I'm going with that story. So when I'm in the middle and I'm kind of slumping and going, oh gosh, the actual work to make this story is a lot and it's tough and I need, I need some inspiration. But if I can see where I'm going, it's easier. And that's, that's part of the reason why I always say like start small, start writing a short story, write just one moment, one interaction between two characters and then say that it's done, and then write a second story. So there's all sorts of way to um, watch out for burnout, and one of them is just to walk away sometimes and say, you know what, I'm gonna take a break. I'm gonna go like take a walk outside, or go swimming, or like play with my dog, or whatever. Just, just, just then come back to the drawing board, or the writing board, or whatever you'd like to call it, feeling a little fresher and ready to tackle the next page. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's it. Thank you all so, so much.